men are Freemasons, members of a worldwide fraternity which unites working men in small towns with men of rank and opulence occupying the highest seats of power. Once public Masonic parades were commonplace, but this annual march by the Masons of Melrose in Scotland is probably the last in Britain. The march honors the stonemasons who built Melrose Abbey and gives local Freemasons a chance to parade their new lodge master around the town. But Britain's other 9,000 lodges meet behind closed doors and the identity of most of Britain's half a million Masons is a closely guarded secret. It's estimated that of 135,000 serving policemen in Britain, 22,000, or one in six, are Freemasons. Most Masons say there is no conflict of interest between police work and membership of the Brotherhood, but some outsiders disagree. What is certain, and I've seen the evidence for it and other people have seen it, that there are lists of lodges which include active criminals and serving policemen in the same lodge, and that can never be right. Critics also worry that Masons are concentrated in many other powerful institutions, notably the law. Confidential Masonic documents reveal that hundreds of magistrates, at least 18 circuit judges, four Queen's Bench judges, three family division judges, two judges in chancery, three Lord Justices of Appeal, and one Lord of Appeal are Masons. But it's in the city of London that the greatest concentration of Masons is found. For Britain's richest square mile, there are hundreds of Masonic lodges in which brothers from the great banks and insurance houses, the stock exchange, and all the other money markets meet in secret. Here at the Guildhall, from which the city is governed, Masons gather in the crypt for a meeting of the Guildhall Lodge. A past lodge master, Sir Kenneth Cork, is handed the briefcase containing his ceremonial apron by his chauffeur. The head of one of the city's most successful accountancy firms, specializing in company liquidations and bankruptcies, Sir Kenneth is also a former Lord Mayor of London. Since 1900, 70 London Lord Mayors have been masters of Guildhall Lodge, evidence of the high esteem in which Masons are held in Britain's traditional institutions. But have other Masons used the Brotherhood for corrupt ends, as even some Masons claim? I think that people uh, use Freemasonry or, or for the wrong purposes. They, they use it as a way to get on, to improve their position, to get promotion. And uh, corrupt people uh, use, uh, use it to um, carry out their corrupt, corruption in a, in a secret manner, with very little chance of being caught. Junior Warden, there is a report. Tonight, in the first of six programs on the Brotherhood's power and influence, we investigate the secret ceremonial rituals of the ancient fraternity of free and accepted Masons and show how its members have ranged from the highest to the lowest in British society, from kings to convicts. Whom have you there? Mr. Martin, a poor candidate in a state of darkness. Filming the mysteries of Freemasonry is forbidden. So, using Masonic handbooks and helped by Master Masons, we have reconstructed the Brotherhood's rituals. Tonight, thousands of men all over Britain are performing these mystic rites. Worshipful Master, Mr. Martin, a poor candidate in a state of darkness who has been well and worthily recommended there are three degrees of initiation into basic craft Freemasonry. This is the first degree ritual in which the candidate seeks to become an apprentice Mason. Do you, Brother Inner Guard, vouch that he has been properly prepared? I do, Worshipful Master. Then let him be admitted in due form. Brother Deacons. Do you feel anything? Yes. Women are not allowed to become Masons, and some interpretations of the ritual say the candidate's left breast is exposed to prove that he is not a woman. His trouser leg is rolled up to show that he's able-bodied, and he is blindfolded because he is in a state of darkness seeking light. To non-Masons, these rituals might seem a strange pastime for grown men to indulge in. 
But psychologist Jane Furbank, who studied male bonding, believes that Freemasonry may satisfy a deeper need than other all-male groups. Thus assured, I will thank you to kneel while the blessing of heaven is invoked on our proceedings. On the purely practical level, it has the same need as joining the local chamber of commerce, the golf club and all the rest. Um, but it does also give you what's called a rite of passage. It takes you in from being adolescent or from being what's technically called a peripheral male, one on the outside. Brings you into the centre, into the heart, where the power and the influence is. That power and influence knows few bounds. The Palace of Westminster houses one of English masonry's best-kept secrets. The existence of two lodges reserved for men who work in Parliament. One of these, the Gallery Lodge, was founded 100 years ago by pressmen and lobby correspondents. The other was created at the suggestion of the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VIII, an ardent mason. In the 1920s, he was upset to learn Labour politicians were being blackballed when proposed as members of Masonic lodges. The craft stood to be condemned as the Tory party in aprons, and when Labour looked set to become the party of government, Masonry was in danger of losing all influence over Britain's future. The Prince suggested a new lodge to welcome Labour MPs and so draw them into both Masonry and the middle ground of British politics. The aptly named New Welcome Lodge was consecrated in 1929 and today it contains 20 past and present MPs from all leading parties. Yet it must tread a careful path if it's not to break one of the Brotherhood's loudly proclaimed rules. Your obedience must be proved by a strict observance of our laws and regulations, by abstaining from every topic of political and religious discussion. Despite this injunction against discussing politics within the Lodge, there is no rule against Masons interfering in politics outside the Lodge. In 1935, Masons played a crucial role in the election of a new leader of the Labour Party. Clement Attlee and one of his rivals for the leadership, Arthur Greenwood, were Masons but a third candidate, Herbert Morrison, was not. In an interview filmed in 1965, but not broadcast, Morrison reflects on Freemasonry's damaging effect on his career. Somebody, who I do not know, uh, anonymously, sent me a copy of a notice convening a Freemason's Lodge meeting. A few days, anything up to a week, I forget the exact lapse of time um, before this meeting of the parliamentary party to decide upon the leadership and the anonymous writer suggested that the meeting of the Freemasons Lodge was to win support for Mr. Arthur Greenwood who was known to be a Freeland Mason and in fact was a very important officer of this lodge. Yet as Freemason Robert Burns perhaps meant to say even the best laid plans of Mason men can fail. Greenwood came third in the first ballot and was eliminated. In the runoff, the Masons switched their vote to Brother Attlee. This ensured the defeat of the non Mason Morrison. So, despite Freemasonry's claim never to interfere in politics, it seems the Brotherhood had a direct influence on one of the most important British political decisions this century. Shows that the country is ready. Worshipful brother Attlee went on to become Prime Minister in 1945 and stayed Labour leader until 1955. Today, British Masons still occupy positions of political power. At least two cabinet ministers are members of the Brotherhood. Cecil Parkinson belongs to the Royal Athelstan Lodge and the Potter's Bar Lodge, which meets in his constituency. And Lord Belstead belongs to the exclusive Kaiser Ihind Lodge. He became leader of the House of Lords in 1988, succeeding another Mason, Viscount Whitelaw, who had been Mrs. Thatcher's deputy prime minister.